The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory tragedy was one such employer. Their approximately 600 workers received average wages, six to seven dollars a week. They worked 14 hour days in a 60 to 70 hour work week. On March 25th, 1911, a deadly fire broke out in the factory, killing mostly teenage girls. It was the largest industrial disaster in the history of New York City and the worst workplace tragedy until September 11th, 2001. This disaster, in conjunction with Heinz's long-standing work, led to legislation improving workplace standards. In 1930, Lewis Hines stated, there are two things I wanted to do. I wanted to show the things that had to be corrected. I wanted to show the things that had to be appreciated. Smith and Rask of New Hine would be the perfect choice for recording the construction of the world's greatest skyscraper. They had an incredible regard for their own skilled laborers, so much so that even today in the lobby, there are plaques commemorating the various jobs performed. In addition, a special honorary plaque distinguishes some of the most prestigious craftsmen. A total of 32 men are honored from each trade involved in the construction of the Empire State Building, as voted by their own fellow workers. Charles Sexton is considered the greatest bricklayer in history. With over 10 million bricks in the Empire State Building, he and dozens of other bricklayers had to work at incredible speeds. His fellow co-workers honored him. Giuseppe Rusciani, an immigrant from Italy, was also selected from among thousands. In March 1930, Hein began to document the construction of the building. photographed the workers in precarious positions while they labored to secure the iron and steel framework of the basic structure. Often, Hein would endure the same risks the workers encountered. In order to obtain the best vantage points, he was swung out on a specially designed basket 1,000 feet above Fifth Avenue. Working at these heights, Hein stated, that he felt safer on that construction site than he did walking the streets of New York. These workers came from all different parts of the world. Never before or subsequently has the labor of a building been so masterfully documented. At the end of his life, Louis Hine was relegated to the same level of poverty he had earlier recorded in his pictures. He died at age 66 on November 3, 1940, penniless and not to be appreciated until years later. The American flag was hoisted atop the Empire State Building on a cold and blustery day, May 1, 1931. Al Smith strolled down Fifth Avenue with his wife, two granddaughters, and a wide variety of dignitaries in preparation for celebrating the opening of the building. The Empire State Building was not only finished on time, but also under budget. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., President Herbert Hoover ceremoniously pressed a button from inside the White House, igniting thousands of lights inside the building. Back in New York, a ribbon was cut for the official opening. Guests then ascended to the 86th floor observation deck, where Al Smith addressed a crowd heralding the new skyscraper. We are on the top of the 86th floor of the Empire State Building, the highest point in the world today that can be reached from a building designed, fashioned, built by the brain, the brawn, the ingenuity, and the muscle of mankind.
dirigibles, also known as blimps, had begun to sweep across the world in the early 1900s and continued to gain popularity throughout the 1920s and 30s. They were touted as the aircrafts of the future, and artists rendered drawings on postcards that illustrated what a dirigible landing on a dock atop the Empire State Building would look like. Conceivably, the dirigible would anchor itself to the mooring mast, which would then let the passengers dismount on the 102nd floor. Yet, only one dirigible ever docked at the Empire State Building's mast. In September 1931, a small dirigible traveled to the top of the building, watched by a fascinated public. And a bundle of newspapers was thrown down to the roof by a rope as the dirigible docked for a mere three minutes. Waiting down below was Al Smith, who ceremoniously retrieved the newspaper bundle. However, the excitement did not last long. It was later determined that the air drafts from the height of the building and the dangers of possible explosions over the city as well as the infeasibility of tying up a giant blimp by a single rope made the whole idea a tenuous one. Six years later, the dream of dirigibles as the wave of aviation's future pretty much ceased completely. When on May 6, 1937, the famed Hindenburg exploded in Lakehurst, New Jersey, killing 36 people. The great triumph of erecting this building in 14 months and well under budget at $41 million was quickly tarnished by the Great Depression. Only a third of its 102 stories were occupied. Extensive ads were taken out in all the major newspapers and business magazines in a mostly failed attempt to lure new occupants. Al Smith went to the then governor, Franklin Roosevelt, to seek New York's support. John Jacob Raskob approached his old friend, Alfred P. Sloan, the chairman of General Motors, who moved a few of GM's divisions to the new building. Raskob also called on Pierre Dupont, and was able to obtain some rentals from the DuPont Corporation. But it was the dollars collected for the 86th floor observatory that saved the building from bankruptcy. And to this day, the revenues from the three million plus annual visitors contribute a substantial part of the building's income. It was a dark and foggy Saturday morning on July 28, 1945 in New York City. The war in Europe had ended while the conflict in the Pacific raged on a half a world away. 27-year-old West Point graduate and veteran of over 30 World War II bombing missions, Colonel William Smith was flying a new B-25 bomber to Newark Airport to have the plane retrofitted for the Pacific campaign. As he approached the thick fog, he was contacted by LaGuardia's air traffic controller, who directed him to land there instead. But Smith apparently believed he could maneuver through the fog and still make it to Newark Airport. The military air traffic controller at Newark Airport fatefully overrode the air traffic controller's words. At the present time, I can't see the top of the Empire State Building. He was only seven miles away. Mistaking the East River for the Hudson River, Smith found himself in a tangle of skyscrapers.